Yeah, I'd like to uh, introduce my great colleague, Dr. John McCutcheon. He's been here a little over a year, I believe, uh, in the Center for Mechanisms of Evolution. John got his uh, undergrad degree in biochem at, in Utah and uh, his PhD at Wash University in St. Louis in computational biology. He then went to University of Arizona for a postdoc. And from there, uh, got his first academic job at University of Montana, where he spent several years uh, before coming here. Uh, within a few weeks of arriving here, he's elected a fellow of the AAAS. And I guess most of you have heard he's become ASU's first Howard Hughes investigator over the past month or two. John's done really beautiful work uh, in the area of uh, endosymbiotic bacteria living in insects. He's a really nice mixture of biochemistry, genomics, and cell biology. And welcome, John. Thanks, Mike. Uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. So I'm going to keep this really uh, high level. So if you have, you know, I, I am interested in the details of, like Mike said, cell biology, genomics, biochemistry, but I'm not going to talk about that because I have seven minutes. So next slide. I'm going to try to give you sort of two, two high level things from the lab. The first one is sort of how we got to ask the questions that we asked. And the second one is the sort of framework that we're asking the question in. So it's a real high level stuff. But, but again, if you're interested, basically, if you're interested in intracellular bacteria and you find this remotely interesting, uh, please come and find me and let's talk. So we, we work on insects and, and, and that still surprises me in some ways because I, I came from a medical school background and I worked on model organisms, but we kind of stumbled into this really interesting thing in insects. So basically to, to keep it brief, we study bacteria that have taken up permanent, near permanent residence inside of insect cells. So lots of different kinds of insects. They're sap feeding insects for the most part. This is a cicada. Uh, so the things you hear screaming in the summer here, we, we worked on those. In fact, that's the very first insect I worked on when I started my postdoc. Um, but we, and so that's sort of the, the sort of ecological context. And I'll give you a little bit more detail there. But we, we've sort of transitioned into thinking about what's happening inside of cells. And, and from a sort of practical standpoint, what we're studying is bacteria that form extremely long-term persistent infections. So we're very interested in establishment of bacterial infections inside of cells and what the outcomes of those infections are. The next slide, please. So this is a plot of, of genome size, of the size of a genome of a bacteria, uh, and the number of protein coding genes on the y-axis. And so the things you think of as bacteria are gray. So if name a bacterium, it would be in one of those dots. But I've also included the plastids or the, the chloroplasts, which are bacteria, have a bacterial origin, and the mitochondria, which also have a bacterial origin. So from my perspective, these are just the very oldest bacterial infections in life. So next slide, please. So the, for a long time before this insect work started, the, the sort of empirical limit to genome reduction in a bacterium was this bacterium, this intracellular pathogen called mycoplasma genitalium. So it was the empirical limit for decades, really, almost, almost 40 years in terms of how small an, a cellular organism could get, how few genes, how small the genome could be. The next slide, please. And so, but so to sum up 15 years of work, uh, what, what, I, what I and others have done in the field is sort of stumble into these, these bacterial genomes, which are very much smaller than mycoplasma genitalium. And they, they overlap right in the middle of plastids, so chloroplast genomes, and, and they approach the, some of the larger mitochondrial genomes. So really tiny genomes encoding very few genes, in some cases, close to 100 genes. So you can't, you're not an organism, you can't be a free living bacterium with 100 genes. And so next slide, my lab is really studying this plot. I mean, this is really, this plot is the origin of most of our work now. So we're interested in what kind of bacteria become these bacteria that, that establish these really long-term infections. Where do they come from? What kind of free living bacteria give rise to these infections? And we have some really interesting candidates. We want to know at a cell biological level how these bacteria integrate with their host cells. They basically become part of it. They become new organelles. And we want to understand how that works because we think it will tell us something about how the organelles formed a few billion years ago. And then, you know, sort of at a general level, we're interested in the similarities and differences between these infections and pathogens and, and uh, organelles. Next slide, please. So, so we, we think about the framework of infection 
like this. So if you think about a generic eukaryotic cell that becomes infected with a generic bacterium, what I'm asking here, what are the outcomes of these infections? So next, next slide. So there's, there's, one, there's one outcome that, that you might prefer if you're infected, and that is the host cell wins that, that, that bout, right? It's infected by a bacterium, but it's something like a macrophage. And, and so it's some sort of specialized immune cell that's, dis, that's designed, programmed to kill bacteria and it, it engulfs the bacteria, it, it, it forms a phagolysosome and the bacterium's dead, right? So the host wins. That's one outcome of an infection. Next slide. The other outcome of an infection, if you're a successful intracellular pathogen, is that the pathogen wins, right? So pathogenic bacteria, viruses, things like that, but I think about bacteria. So pathogenic bacteria have lots of different kinds of systems to reprogram their host cells to, dis to disrupt the, the pathways that, bacteria, that hosts use, that eukaryotic cells use, to destroy bacteria. And so the other outcome, probably the two best known outcomes of bacterial infections in cells is that either the host wins or the pathogen wins, depending on the host cell and depending on the pathogen or the bacterium that's infecting that cell. So those are the two sort of normal outcomes. Uh, but next slide. The kinds of things that we study, uh, I'm very interested in sort of the paths through this, but, but what, the, what the outcome is, is something different, right? So neither the host wins nor the pathogen wins, but what happens is you get a very long-term bacterial infection form. And you get, you get something that, that, that ends up resembling these things we see in insects. And so we're interested in, in sort of like the, the, the arrows basically through this, through this outcome. How does it start? We think actually it starts uh, in something like a host pathogen relationship. And we have a lot of evidence from the field and from other fields that this is the case. So we're interested in this sort of pathogenic origins, but then something happens and that infection gets diverted and it becomes not only tolerated, but required by the host cell. And so next and final slide. So we, we know now that these things we study, I call them host beneficial endosymbiosis. We know that they work at a cell biological and biochemical level. They resemble the function of mitochondrion plastids. We've shown this a number of different ways and we're working on a number of different problems to, to basically, we've basically shown that, that they work in, in, in biochemical, cell biological ways that are very similar. So we know that's true. And so we can say that what we're studying here is maybe like a transitional form of mitochondrial or mitochondria or plastid. And then we hope by doing various experiments at the origin of this infection, we might get some into insight into how the mitochondrion and plastid formed in the first place, which are basically almost impossible to see because they happened 1.5, 1.2 billion years ago. Next slide. That's it, that's me. That's a really high level uh, description of what we do. Again, if you're interested in the details, I like techniques, I like microscopy, I like biochemistry. Uh, reach out. I have an email address. I have an office. Come see me. Thanks. Cool. Well, we do have, we have a, um, a minute or two here to answer questions. So if anybody has a question, please type it in the chat um, while, while people are doing that. So you don't have a billion years. So how are you, gonna, how are you going to do your experiments in a sort of time frame? Like, how, what do you do to accelerate? Yeah, yeah, so, so that's a really, yeah, so we don't, unfortunately. So what we have, we have these extant infections, which are 100 to 300 million years old. Okay. And we have, we have sort of toeholds into the function of how they work. And we have relatives of the bacteria that become these long-term infections that are free living. We can do genetics on them. Uh -huh. so what we're doing is we can basically do screens in set insect cell lines with these bacteria to look at the upstream pathways that these bacteria use and then try to link them to the sort of 300 million year old infections that we have and then link those to the 1.2 billion year old infections that we have. And there's some evidence that, that we're gonna get there. Uh, I mean, you, you have to squint, but this is a hard problem, so you always have to squint. Uh, but that, that's the idea. So by studying new infections, we can sort of link that to medium term infections and link that to old infections. Very cool. Very cool. And um, I'm just going to remind everyone that, um, uh, Grant McFadden, just remind everyone that uh, you're giving a full seminar um, next week on Wednesday at noon. Yeah, I'll show actual data. In that. <laughs> cool. Yeah. So if you want to catch the details on how this all works. Oh, really yeah, I, I could answer these 
there's a couple of questions I could quickly um, go for it. Yeah. If, you, if there's time, I don't want to. Yeah, okay. Yeah, uh, yeah, we have time. So I see Petra. Uh, yeah, what kind of? It's sorry, it's moving. Um, what kind of imaging techniques? We've used everything from we use light microscopy, various types of electron microscopy, ambient temperature, and and now we have some cryo EM, some some CET experiments going in San Diego. Uh, we use nano sims. We've used all sorts of all sorts of imaging techniques. Cool. And then one last one yeah, yeah. is why is it so rare that this happens? It's actually not. I mean, so I I actually have this. I've been trying to put together some evidence that one of these bacteria we study is is probably the most. It's it's one of the most common infections in animals. Uh, that's actually not known because if it were known, you'd know it. But it's not known, and 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 so I. I think the infections are common. They're not common in vertebrates, right? So if you have an, if you have adaptive immunity, you don't see it that often or at all, probably that often. But if you're an invert, if you're a protist or a worm or an insect, they happen all the time. They're super. Oh, uh, yeah. So that's that's the short answer is that there's something about. I mean, vertebrate immunity works. Okay. Well, it's good to hear. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So congratulations, everyone. You've done yeah, it. Yeah, right.